Our next speaker, probably well known to quite a few of you, is uh, Professor James Rowe from the Sheep CRC. Thanks, James. Thank you, Mick. Now, one of the things which you need to understand, could you have the first slide, is that in the sheep industry, the cattle industry and other livestock industries, it is genetics, genetics, genetics that underpins productivity gain. And for a nutritionist, that's a really tough thing to say, but it's true. What we're going to focus on today is just how, how much um, genetics is contributing to current gain and what the future is um, for genomic technologies. Now, in the sheep industry, we've had a bit of a hiccup, um, and we're just recovering from that, but we're recovering from it pretty quickly. It's all about changing from a wool industry, which is really, really simple to achieve genetic gain in. This picture here shows a practice which stood the industry in very good shape from 1860 through to current uh, sort of era of 2000. But you can see when it got to around 1990, we hit a road bump. That nice smooth increase in productivity, increased fleece weights, um, quality of wool improving was wonderful until we had that wonderful reserve price scheme cancelled in 1991 and the other thing that happened in 1990 was a real transformation of the lamb industry. The, the, the sheep meat industry at that point was absolutely on its knees and at that point it turned around. So what we're talking about here is the transition from a wool industry, simple genetics, to a sheep industry, where there's a level of complexity because you've got reproductive efficiency, growth, eating quality. We've also got animal health challenges, which we never had in those early days, when you just drenched animals and you mules them and you had no other issues. Those are gone. So what's happened at that point where you saw the troubled little bit in that nice smooth curve from 1860, was the fact that genetics got a lot more complicated. And I think if you look back, we'll look at the merino stud industry and lay the blame fairly at their feet for not recognising the fact that we'd moved from wool to sheep. They're still grappling hard with the concept of using um, data and modern technologies. And it's held the whole industry back. It's, not a, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, really serious issue. But the good news is we're on our way. This summarises the genetic gain that we've seen in the terminals, the meat breed from 1990. That's the blue line. And you can see the same genetic gain that's been made in the merino industry, the green line. And you can see that around 2000, um, 2001, with the introduction of across flock comparisons, that terminal meat genetic gain just took another lift. So at the moment, you've got the meat side going along with all their technology for um, selection going four times faster in its genetic gain. And what that means in terms of the carcass characteristics, the meat production in this lamb section, just look at that blue line. Since 1990 to around 2010, 2012, it's gone up four and a half kilos of carcass weight. That's around 250 additional grams of saleable meat yield per year on a cumulative basis. Genetics is cumulative. So this is going up just beautifully. The merino sector is not all doom and gloom. Now we've got here that line, that red line at the bottom, is the average flock, chugging along, going along nice and slowly, at around about... 70 cents per U per year. That's the average gain. But we've got the top 10% of people in the merino ram breeding industry who worked out this game that we're in the sheep industry, and they worked it out around 1990, and they've been ticking along at a rate of genetic gain that's delivering around $2.20 per U joined per year. Now, there are two things that come out of this. One is the rate of change, and the other is just the difference that has accumulated over this 20-year uh, period. You've got that 30-point difference in that index. That's a complex production index that you're following to get balanced gain. 
And at the top line, the top 10% are getting an extra $14 per U per year. And it's just going up at that rate of $2.20 per year per year. So it's a pretty good space to be in. So let's go on a little bit further then and look at genomics. That's where we're at. The blue line on the left-hand side, that, hist that uh, histogram there showing 100%, that's where the industry's at now, going along at best practice. If you throw genomic technologies, that's the use of DNA testing to get better predictions of true genetic merit, we go up around 5 7%. It's just because you're predicting the true genetic merit of an animal with about 10% more accuracy. The other thing that genetic uh, gain offers us when we go to genomics is that you can pick your animals of superior merit when they're much younger. So you start using rams at seven, eight months old instead of 18 months old. Now under those conditions, which is where that top section of the industry is moving, we've got a gain of around 20% in the rate of genetic gain. So that's pushing us up from around 220 up to around 260 to $2.70 um, per U per year as the, as the target. And here you say, yes, but these sheep are going to eat more. It's just going to cost us somewhere along the line. But it's not true. It's a free kick. Genetics is pretty well a free kick because what we're doing is increasing efficiency. What we've got here is if you've got an animal growing along at 150 grams a day, they're going to be around for about another 80 to 90 days longer. And during that time, they just need more feed to keep the basic um, system going without even growing. On the other hand, if you've got that animal with the genetics to grow 300 grams a day, they're going to need a lot more energy and protein to grow, but the energy component protein for maintenance is far less. Similarly for more efficient reproductive efficiency, you need a lot more nutrients in a ewe that's going to produce twins but than, than uh, a single, but if you divide that over the whole year that the ewe's around um, and then divide it by two and not one, you're well, well ahead. So it's a free kick, it's real efficiency that we're looking at. The next um, part of the story is the way that data really links in to drive genomics. If you want to measure something, you um, improve it, you've got to measure it, and there's nothing truer than that particular statement when you come to genomics. Using genomic technology is actually a very simple concept. All you need to do is measure in thousands and thousands of animals a whole lot of phenotypic data, that's reproduction, wool, meat, and you take samples of DNA, blood samples do in our case, and you analyze them for all of the genetic differences, the, gen the DNA differences. You then get these predictive equations that allows you to take a drop of blood from the animal up in the top right-hand corner, um, analyze it, and you, with one test, can predict the genetic merit for the whole range of parameters you've measured. But let's just show you where the data bit comes in. And what we've got here is a, a, a simplified summary of the uh, data that's collected as part of the process that we did to calibrate these DNA tests. So you've got to follow, just uh, through the top, you get AI, you follow the production of the animal. At each stage, you're taking measurements on parasitology, DNA, meat samples, wool, that goes through laboratories, etc. Massive, massive org um, organization collecting about five million um, data points. That goes to um, two and a half billion if you put the DNA data in too. But out of it, what you've got is a really cost-effective, powerful way of driving genetic gain for many years to come. The true benefits of this technology come from the faster genetic gain, and we've mentioned that um, previously. You've also got the improvement of these difficult-to-measure traits. And these are the things like eating quality. And I'll come to show you just how important that eating quality is. You've got the ability to measure and predict resistance to parasites. And you've also got those difficult traits like reproduction. The value of those is only going to become apparent fully in the next few years, but it's massive. 
But the third thing that is really important, and I'll come um, back to this in a couple of slides in the future, um, is that catalyst that this genomic technology provides for those merino breeders and others who've effectively been left behind. It gives them an opportunity to step back onto this train and move along. It's that ability to switch quite quickly from this 70 cents per year per year to a $2.20 um, trajectory. And I just want to show you what that means in terms of cash. If you wake up tomorrow and decide that you're going to improve your RAM selection and you don't even change the um, source but you, your RAMs are going to be going on the $2.20 projectory rather than the 70 uh, cents projectory, you'll end up on the blue line. However, if you go back to that slide that I showed where, you'd, where, where the top 10% of the Merino RAMs had got to, that $14 up the tree, and you buy your rams from those top studs, that's where you end up with the blue line. And so that's effectively, after 10 years, just by changing the source of rams and not even going for the top ones, you're going to be $17,000 per year better off. That's for a 2,000, a modest-sized flock. And if you do it, uh, look at the same thing for buying those better rams, that's $31,000 you're better off each year um, by the time you've been in this for 10 years. One of the critical things with genetics is that you don't see the benefit tomorrow. You know, with, with, when you're drenching your sheep for parasites, they've got worms one day, you drench them and you fixed it. With genetics, you've got to look just a few years ahead, and that's the sort of benefits you get when you look that far ahead. Just want to talk about this quality issue, because with lamb particularly, and with wool also, quality really matters. This is a set of data from Abair showing the price, the retail price of lamb and, and chicken. And you can see from 1980 to around 1990, they both tracked down nicely down this commodity slide, going down at about 35 cents per year per year. A terrific place to be. Pork did the same, Andrew. <laughs> Everything was on that sort of line. In 1990, remember I've mentioned that date before, at that point, the lamb industry, absolutely on its knees, decided to fix the genetics and to market this product, both in Australia as the trim lamb campaign and in America as the, um, as, as, as the free range um, lamb initiative. Since that point, the trend line on price per kilogram in 2014 prices has been plus 26 cents per kilogram per year. There is nothing in agriculture that looks that good. And as Ben indicated, 90 bucks a kilo for chops is not too much to pay. So get your mind around this, guys, because that's where we're going. <laughs> but the key issue is how do we manage that? One of the big steps in managing quality in the lamb industry came from just managing the supply chain. And this MSA, the Meat Standards Australia standards, that was controlling chiller temperatures, getting your slaughter uh, conditions right. It just removed that huge tail. This is toughness on the bottom axis. And what happens when you get a tough bit of lamb, you don't eat lamb for a while, you've got to get rid of that tail, and that's what's happened. That's what you find if you go and sample a whole lot of supermarket product now. We fixed it by getting the supply chain right. But there's a new dimension to this, which is genetics and genomics. This is probably the most important slide because it summarizes around seven years of data where we studied the genetics of production, meat quality, that complex diagram I showed you. We got real consumers to score topside, which is a tough meat, and loin, which is a very tender one. And the higher the score, for this top side and for the loin, the more acceptable it is to the consumer. Interestingly, a consumer will pay twice as much for five star as they will for three star, and that's rock solid information. Now each dot on that curve represents a progeny group from a, right, from a single sire. Okay, so what you're looking at there is a genetic range. 
Unfortunately, when you breed for animals that grow fast, are lean and have little fat, they get tougher and tougher. This is the most productive ram in Australia. But it's the toughest, so we shot it. <laughs> and, and the future is actually up here. You know, this is where we need to go as an industry, a really smart industry. The good news is that we've got the genomic markers to select animals for consumer eating quality. So not only are we going for lean meat yield, but we're going for eating quality as the driver of future consumer demand. And we're bringing in some pretty snappy uh, measurement equipment to a, a DEXA, a dual energy X-ray, gives a very accurate prediction of lean meat yield, which is the processor and supermarket's delight, lean meat yield. And we're measuring intramuscular fat with hyperspectral imaging because it's that intramuscular fat that really drives that top level of consumer satisfaction. We're able then to share that data. And this is, this is a challenge, but it's happening now that that data needs to go to genetics, it needs to go feedback to the producers, and it goes to our Meat Standards uh, Australia, which links into the supply chain. So, finally, Mick, and I'm out of here, skills development. We're talking about technology which sounds really simple, but it's not. You know, it really needs training and skills development for the industry to capture and use these new technologies effectively. And skimping on the skills development, the training, is absolutely dumb. You know, and we, as a CRC, put a huge amount of effort into specific training programs that help people manage reproduction, help you use the genetics and genomics, how you use the electronic ID and the data capture systems. Because without specific, really sophisticated training and the engagement of service providers, third party private sector third, um, service providers, we're not going to get this traction. So really, what we're looking at here, and I've stolen a line from um, the Audi company, but it is all about moving ahead through being innovative and using technology. And genomics gives us an incredible platform on which to build. We've also got to build the capacity to collect machine-to-machine -machine data. We've got to have the capacity to use it, and we've got to have the skills to make sure that we capitalize on it. So thank you.